new on Curiosity Stream. I'm James Burke. I'm going to take you on a journey through time. James Burke's visionary series returns, reimagined for our time. Now, this is all uncharted territory. The Washington Post hails Burke as one of the most intriguing minds in the Western world. The New York Times raves he careens from one great moment in history to another. Where do we want to go from here? Experience all new connections. So what's the next connection? With monthly, annual, and bundled plans, find the one that works for you at curiositystream.com. You probably know the feeling. Sweaty, fast breathing, quick heart rate. That's a cortisol spike. It feels awful, and its imbalance is the cause of your anxiety. Rebalance Health's three-part anxiety system helps address it at the root. Rebalance Health lozenges are natural and designed for optimal absorption, providing 24-hour relief. Live life fully without feeling like you're fighting for it. Get 50% off your first month with code CALM23 at rebalancehealth.com. Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. I'll let you guys on a little secret yesterday. I'm actually doing this on the second because the day you're listening to this, my oldest is 17. Can't believe it. Happy, happy birthday, Taylor. And my life changed forever 17 years ago, and I could not be more grateful. Um, So the last episode was really long, and I thought it was important to do that because it sets up to have all of Alex's statements in one place, and then we go now to Tylee and Lori, and then we're able to pick out those discrepancies. So today we're going to do Lori and Tylee's police interview at the station, and I was thinking just in between these shows you know, my daughter is going to be 17 tomorrow and, or today. And Tylee never got to 17. They killed her. They murdered her uh, less than two months after what we all know to likely be coaching and having Tylee do their dirty work because she had to live with these people. And we don't know what was said to her about why she needed to do this, but this poor baby was conflicted. You can see it in the um, in her body language. We showed it on the last episode. I'm going to show you again real quick, just self-soothing. Uh, Lori's laughing, not a care in the world. Poor Tylee, she's just um, not comfortable as, you know, as expected. So anyways, we're going to jump right in so we can get these both in without it being an hour. Uh, Appreciate you guys being patient. But Lori's police station interview, obviously the same morning as the murder. It started at 9.43 a.m., lasts for about 26 minutes total. Uh, At the end, Lori's left on uh, a camera in the room for about 30 minutes. When the investigator comes back, the investigator went to interview Tylee came back with a victim's advocate. So, um, you know, it's amazing. And actually, I was re-watching the Dateline um, from, oh, it was last year when uh, uh, Hidden True Crime uh, were on. And Dr. John talks about how Tylee is a bundle of nerves in that chair, and you do see it, because I'd never watched the time where she was alone. So I really was able to just see that body language of... um, Man, poor baby, just breaks my heart. All right, so let's get started with Lori's interview. As she walks in, she's actually talking about Tylee taking her GED with the investigator. And she says elementary and junior high, they worked with Tylee, but there's so many kids in high school that they just don't care. So Lori told Tylee she was smart enough to take the GED, and she did. Lori says she passed the first time with college ready in every category. And I don't doubt that. Um, what's sad to me is, is so many people were told that Tylee was going to, to Rexburg to go to BYU. And you just look at what Lori denied this child, uh, by them taking her life. And it, it just, you know, marriage kids getting out from under her mom, hopefully, you know, she would have got a lot of therapy. I'm, I'm sure she would have needed it after being Lori's daughter, uh, 
all those years. And then JJ is just stuff. So anyways, this, this, this always for me, the time around Charles's murder is so sad because it really sets things into motion fast and furious. And what within three months, just over three months and a few days, um, we would have three more victims of these people. So the investigator asked Lori if she lives in the house and Lori says, yes. And the investigator says, I know this sounds silly, but the best way for you to tell me what happened is just start with what makes the most sense for you. And I'll ask you a bunch of questions to clarify. So before we get started, actually, I want to say this investigator really helped Lori a lot, in my opinion, through this interview. And I'll point out when I think, you know, she made it too easy on Lori. And Lori says so. And she kind of starts giggling and puts her head in her hands while smiling. And Lori says that Charles got the house for her three weeks ago since her family's all here and they came from Houston. She said they decided to separate. So he says, I'll pay for a house for you and JJ because he's all about JJ, never about Tylee. Can I just say throughout this interview, you really see the resentment that Lori had towards JJ apparently because every time she talks about him, her tone changes to kind of sarcastic and um that was something i had never really noticed before but she said they decided to separate so you know he's all about jj she explains that they adopted him together when he was a baby and they were raising him together and that jj is charles's biological great nephew and she calls jj a drug baby and this really bothers me i think all she's trying to do is make herself a martyr and look like a really noble person when he, he's an amazing kid or he was an amazing kid and man, she didn't deserve him. So she says that Charles travels all the time and he's used to going back and forth. He's usually gone Monday through Friday and that Charles had come to bring her some things when she first moved back from Houston in a U-Haul and he hasn't been back, but he was making all these threats on my phone all the time. So when asked about the threats, Lori kind of stopped and paused for a second and told the detective she would just need to read them. And the investigator never read them from what I saw. She said Charles was always mad at her and he didn't want a divorce, but she says I didn't like him and I didn't want to deal with him. She said they were married for 14 years and she points over to the room where Tylee is and says Charles has always been horrible to her and says Charles and Tylee were always getting into huge fights. So she said Charles told her all of a sudden that he was coming in town to see JJ on that Wednesday she told the investigator that she never kept JJ from him and said he could come see him whenever he wanted to, take him to school. Lori says, like, I'm not going to do that. The investigator said when he initially said he was going to buy you a house here, and Lori corrects her and says rent. And she says all of her family lives here, and they lived uh, there in Arizona together a long time. She said then he moved them to Houston she said, my son was out of school. He didn't have anything, any of his services. His DDD, which is the Division of Developmental Services. She says JJ was ripped out of school and said we're moving. And Lori said she didn't go with him at first and he took him. She didn't mention that she disappeared for over two months and refused to see her son. But, you know, she said Charles took JJ and she let him. And she said, I didn't file anything against him. She said Charles filed something saying she would only have supervised visits because she's crazy. And she said she didn't talk to him for 30 days. And she said, let him take care of JJ to let him see what she's been doing for the last seven years. And she said, because men need to do that. She says, I have five grown kids. I have a grandkid. She said, you're going to threaten me that you're not going to let me see my child without supervised visits. Okay, do it for 30 days and see how long it lasts. She said Charles was begging her to pick JJ up, which is a lie, big fat lie. If you remember probably a week and a half ago, we talked about the email Charles sent to Lori where he's talking about the routine that him and JJ had when they were alone in Texas. He was taking a tubby by himself, reading their scripture at night, and it really seemed like the most normal uh, JJ had been in a very long time, and unfortunately, when... Uh, they moved back to Arizona. All that was gone. But she said her and Tylee eventually left everything and moved to Houston. She said she left all of her family, all of uh, JJ's support, like his cousins and everything. 
She said she tried to enroll him in school there in Texas, get all of his services, and it takes forever. And the investigator said there's no easy transfer. And Lori says there's no easy transfer. It's a whole new state. And Charles didn't do any of it. Um, talking about his services, he didn't even apply. I did. But if you remember, Charles said he had a private teacher coming in for JJ at the home. Uh, Lori laughs and says, long story, I'll keep it short. She said Charles hadn't been there for a couple of weeks since they moved in, and then he came. She said he was very nasty when he was there, but he travels for work and went back to the Houston house. Then he tells her he was coming to see JJ on Wednesday night, pick him up for school Thursday and Friday, and she said that was fine, but he couldn't stay at the house because he couldn't get along with Tylee. Lori said she's a minor, and she has to live here, and he gets in huge fights with her. And she hates him, so she would book him a hotel. He stays in hotels all the time because he travels. And she said the business, quote, pays for it. She used air quotes. I don't know what she was getting at there. So the investigator asked, what does Charles do? And Lori says he works with teachers on their retirement plans, but he goes to them at their school. And he <clears throat> mostly works in California. She said no matter where he lived, in Hawaii, he'd work in California. Uh, he'd work in Texas. She said his job gave him freedom, so he doesn't have to stay home and take care of a special needs child. So I've done that myself for seven years, and before that with my um, own two kids, essentially. And she sounds so resentful, guys. It's uh, so gross. She said, I had two kids. He had two kids. We tried to make a family. So he comes last night, and I say, you can't stay at this house because you can't get along with Tylee. Uh, you can come play with JJ, but he goes to school all day. She said, I got him back in his school. He's getting his services. I met with the DDD yesterday, but we're having to pay $125 a day to get him back in his school because he's so out of his routine and it's been a nightmare. She said, on the floor, kicking stuff, hitting stuff like walls. He just ripped him out of his life only and, and that Charles only thinks of himself, which is gaslighting. I mean, this is a classic example of gaslighting. I mean, if you look at the pictures of that house, these kids had mattresses on the ground, on the floor. Lori had her bed kind of raised up. I'll put that on the next episode on YouTube. So he says, I'm coming to get JJ. And this, uh, this is such a lie. She said, JJ freaks out and says, I don't want dad. Lori says when he knows his dad is coming, it's because he knows his dad took him away. So JJ was freaking out. And she said she didn't tell JJ he was coming to take him to school. She says Charles didn't bother her the night before, and that was surprising because she was expecting kind of an ambush, and he would come over and just be mean, which, again, is gaslighting. Kay and Larry, uh, Charles's brothers, all said this was an ambush with Charles. None of it fits his character, and I fully believe that. She said he expected him to uh, say his name was on the lease and he could stay if he wanted to, calling it his macho attitude. She said she heard from Charles that night before when he said he would be there at 730 in the morning on the day he was murdered to pick up JJ. And that was good that because she said she didn't hear from otherwise. So when she starts talking about the morning of the murder, um, she pauses and you see her eyes moving all around. And we call that searching for answers. Um and the one thing, too, that I noticed is the beginning of this interview where she's talking about their life, um, JJ, Tylee, um, all that. She's very fluid in her answers. When you get to the day of the murder, it's not as fluid. Um, you can tell it's not something that, like, she knows this embedded up here. Probably because, you know, it's a really quick, let's try to get our story straight. And they didn't. She said she expected him to say his name was on the... Oh, okay, I just said that. Sorry. Um, she said that uh, that morning, Charles was banging on the door. And I'm like, oh, great. Here we go. She said she tried to be nice and had JJ's school stuff ready. Lori said he was supposed to be there at 730, but didn't arrive until 735, 740-ish. And she remembers looking at the clock at 730 and that normally Charles was punctual. Lori says JJ was like dad and then mommy and ran to her and held her leg saying, you're not taking me to school. She said she told JJ it was okay and daddy could drive him. She said she was just trying to keep things calm. 
She said Charles was being smirky and jerky to her, so she was ignoring him. And the investigator asked if Alex lived there, and she said no, but he stayed because Lori, Lori said she was worried Charles might come over and cause trouble. So she wanted Alex there because she trusts him. Also, Summer, her sister, told investigators that she asked Alex to stay because of the text she saw. Now, if you remember on last night's episode, we talked about how the investigator several times asked Alex at the end of the interview after he had talked to the obviously to this investigator. And Lori says, I asked him to stay. And Alex is like, no, no, we had plans. We were going to go to the range. Like he said no every time. That investigator said, you're not under the impression, you know, um, that that you were there to to, um, you know, essentially be her protector is no. So she said it's a long story, but she had to go live at Alex's when Charles took JJ and that he's been difficult. She failed to mention she was in Hawaii and Idaho and wherever else she went that time. So Charles said they were leaving in 20 minutes because it's 15 minutes to the school. But Lori said, you can't go this early because the gates don't open until 8.20. Now, here's the what, here's the thing. The website says 8 o'clock. And when I worked at a school much like this one, um, we would have to be there at 7.30 a full hour before the bell rang because it is a lot of work. We had a lot of kids that were in wheelchairs that had to be lifted off the bus on the lifts. That takes probably two to three minutes per kid. Um, just, uh, it doesn't make sense that at a special needs school where you have kids with various degrees of difficulty in mobility and all that stuff, even there were times where even if a kid wasn't in a wheelchair, you'd have to walk that kid to school I mean, to their classroom for safety reasons. It That makes no sense. So she told him to leave with JJ now because she didn't want Charles there and suggested he take JJ to Burger King and get breakfast. She told the investigator JJ's particular and wants chicken fries and Sprite for, for breakfast. And she said she gives him what he wants because if not, he's on the floor screaming. She said he's big and he's heavy and he's hard for me to handle, but anyway. So Lori says Charles agreed to leave, so she gave him J.J.'s backpack, and they got in the car, Charles and J.J. She said Charles always leaves something in the house and never leaves the first time, and she said, I always expected my husband to come back in the house. She said Charles came back because I guess, she said, because I guess, he had left his phone on the counter. When he came back in, Lori had the phone. So I wonder if there's, I mean, I guess not because it's maybe they didn't even do this, but I wonder if, why did they not canvas that neighborhood to see if there were some ring cams that could back up Charles getting back in the car, you know, getting in the car with JJ having to go back in the house. I mean, they didn't do a lot of stuff. That's one thing. Um, and also, um, the thing that doesn't make sense to me is that it's been said in the past, the reason that Charles had a handicap tag on or on their cars is because JJ is a runner. So why would Charles leave him in the car if he knows JJ is prone to running off? It, it doesn't make sense there either. But she said his phone was on the counter and Charles asked for his phone. And Lori said, why don't you show me the text you've been texting? I'm assuming to Adam. Lori says uh, that he's he's been acting really weird, like he was plotting something. And she asks Charles why he's in town. And then she says she knows he's been talking to her brother, Adam, who came in town at the same time. And she says she hasn't talked to her brother in a while. And he was texting Adam when he first got to my house. So we know she went through the phone because he texted Adam at 735. Lori said he got there around 735, 740. And the text to Adam was from outside. As we know in the last episode, Charles said, Al is here. They're up to something. You know, they have that little conversation. Lori says she doesn't talk to Adam. And she says, do you even talk to Adam? She said, Charles had been threatening her, saying you're going down, blaming her for their marriage breakup, blaming her for their niece getting divorced, my friends getting divorced. And he said, I'm a destroyer of families, which I mean, yeah, this is exactly what you are, woman. Um, she said, what would my motiv motivation be for everyone to get divorced so I can babysit kids more? Um, why would I have any control over what people do? It's just very odd. But anyway, 
She says Charles goes nuts, saying that he had gone nuts before and that her and Tylee and JJ had to leave five times over the past few years and stayed at hotels because he goes nuts. She said, you don't know what's going to set him off. Tylee's mad at me for always going back, but we had JJ and he's special needs and it's really hard. But I thought like why you said you do it all on, on your own anyway. So if that's true, it wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't make a difference whether they were together or not. So she says going nuts is yelling and screaming with pushing and grabbing, but not hitting them. But with Tylee, he has gotten physical. And with my grown son, like a physical fist fight when he was 16. And he came after Tylee two times when we were in Hawaii. Like he was going to hit her, but I got between them. And Lori says at the time she was 13 or 14. I, I just don't believe her. Uh, she goes back to the morning of the murder and says he was worried about her seeing whatever was on the phone. She said uh, he was holding the phone. She was holding the phone and Charles was screaming at her. And she said she was walking around the house to stay away from Charles and he was reaching for that phone. She says Tylee came out of her room upset with a bat and said, leave my mom alone. Charles told her not to hit him with the bat. She says Alex comes out into the main room. Now, here's another discrepancy because Alex says Lori comes into his room. If you remember in the beginning when he is put into this alleged situation, she came in his room. Alex came into the living room. Two different stories there. Um, so she said Charles was screaming and super upset and she doesn't know if Tylee tried to hit Charles or not. But Charles grabbed the bat and tried to hit her with it. So Alex never said that Charles grabbed the bat and tried to hit, and I don't know her meaning Tylee or Lori, um, but, and Tylee doesn't say that either. So this is Lori. Alex and Tylee do not say that in their interviews. She said Alex grabbed him from behind to stop him. She says that Charles and Alex start grappling and Charles is hitting Alex with the bat and they're on the ground. And it makes absolutely no sense. We kind of talked about it last episode. How is he going to, I mean, if anything, it's going to be a little boop. Like, I mean, it makes no sense. You cannot put a laceration on somebody's head if you're grappling. Lori says she's freaking out and tries to go around knowing JJ was in the car. Laurie says Charles gets up and has the bat towards her and motions as if Charles is kind of swinging like backhanded. And Lori says she's, she's trying to go around in a way to not get hit. She says Tylee was on the ground because she fell back when Charles grabbed the bat. And she told Tylee to go to the car with JJ because she didn't want JJ coming in, wanted Tylee out of the house and didn't want either one of the kids for what she says, quote, whatever this fight was going to be. She said Alex got up and Charles came at her with the bat, yelling for her to give him his phone back. So the investigator asked if Charles and Alex were saying anything when they're on the ground. And Lori kind of stumbles and says, get off me, Al. And then she says she didn't remember what they said. And she said in the heat of it, they weren't talking. So they got up off the ground and Alex stepped back and Charles was yelling at Lori to give him his phone. And she said it was all quick. Lori said she went in a circle around the kitchen to get away and Alex was there. The investigator asked how Charles was holding the bat and Lori says backwards, like almost like he's kind of putting it on, on his shoulder if he's walking since I don't, I should have maybe screen grabbed that to put it up. Um, and she swings the bat outward, not like a baseball player. Charles played in college uh, and Lori says he was a professional baseball player and it wasn't a good idea for Tylee to get out the bat. And then she thinks that's funny and starts laughing. She said, I was kind of turned around and we were all inside that room except for the kids. And she said she heard the gunshot. The investigator asked if she heard this shot and Lori says, mm hmm. The investigator asked if she if, if boy, that's a tongue twister. If she saw the shot or heard it. Lori's quiet for a couple of seconds. You could tell she's thinking of what to say. She said she was in the kitchen and went around to get away from Charles and heard the shot. So if you're on YouTube, I've got a few things here that uh, a little collage of pictures. Top left is a Zillow picture that was taken when the house was up for sale. You see the checkered floor there. In the picture directly to the right, you can see where the blacked out part is, where Charles was laying. And then the bat's way up here. 
it makes no sense if he's lunging at Alex. Uh, how does the bat end up that far away from Charles? I just don't get it. But anyway, so if you're looking on YouTube, the mirror straight ahead uh, to the left and right, you can see another room. That's the kitchen and like a little dining area. So Lori claims that she ran through that kitchen. Um, and here's the thing. The report says Lori said she was kind of turned around and they all, meaning the three kids and her were outside and heard the gunshot. So Lori said she freaked out and she's laughing as she says this. My brother-in-law died suddenly and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to SelectQuote.com. SelectQuote.com. That's SelectQuote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at SelectQuote.com slash commercials. Elevate your summer with Osea's best selling body care set. It's everything you need for radiant summer skin on the go. Featuring travel sizes of Osea's clean, vegan, cruelty-free, and climate-neutral skincare, like their best-selling Andaria Algae Body Oil. Right now, you can get the Best Sellers Body Care Set, a $78 value, 33% off. And use code SUMMER to save an additional 10%. That's an additional 10% off at OCEAMalibu.com code SUMMER. And she said she went into mom mode and got JJ to school. She says, I gotta go uh, get to the kids. And she said she went outside to see if they were okay and she didn't want them coming uh, back inside. She said JJ was trying to get back inside the house and Tylee had crazy eyes looking at her like what happened. She says they got in the car and they left. And when asked when she came back in and where was Alex, she said that he was in front of Charles and it all happened quickly. She felt like she was there because she was there a second later. She said Alex didn't say anything to her because they were in shock. She said she didn't say anything and she went to check on the kids and was going back in, but maybe I didn't. But here's the thing. If you remember, the investigator in the last episode asks Alex, were Lori and Tylee in the house when you shot him? Nope, nope, nope. Didn't see him again until they pulled up in the driveway. So there's another discrepancy. So Lori said she needed to get JJ to school, call the police and get back. The investigator asked if they talked about calling 911, and Lori said Alex called her and asked if she was taking JJ to school. She said yes and told him they needed to call the police, and Alex said okay. Remember, Alex denied several times to the investigator talking to Lori after the shooting. So the investigator clarified what Alex called her, and um, the investigator clarified that that Alex did call her when she didn't come back inside. She said she was in the car for a minute, freaking out, wondering what to do. Probably coaching Tylee, um, who Lori says Tylee was also freaking out and she didn't want JJ going inside. So she decided to take JJ and get him away from the scene. And the investigator says that's understandable. So the investigator says, you may not know this. And this, I mean, literally says, you may not know this. Don't give her a way out. Ask a straight question and see what she says. Don't don't say, hey, you may not know this, because Lori's going to be like, I don't know. She asked Lori, at what point Alex had the gun? Did he have it when they got in their first fight, or did he have to go get it? And Lori says, guess what? I don't know. Lori pauses for a bunch of seconds, and the, interview, um, the interviewer starts to ask another question, and Lori interrupts. She said she didn't see Alex leave the room, but it all happened so fast, them rolling around on the ground, and I'm screaming. She also said the investigator says this is probably this probably happened within a couple of seconds. And Lori said, yeah, it was super fast. I mean, she just made this so easy on Lori. Don't suggest anything. You ask her and let her answer. It, it was so hard watching this. So the investigator asked if Alex normally carried a gun and the investor investigator says, like, I carry a gun everywhere I go. 
And Lori said he's a gun person and always has guns. She says he's good with guns. And when asked if she knew Alex had one with him, Lori said, no, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did. He's very professional with guns. And the investigator says proficient, responsible, responsible is usually a good word. You can't make this stuff up, y'all. The investigator said when you were trying to get away from him, did you hear anything said between your husband and your brother? And Lori said no. So the investigator said, so my, this may sound very ridiculous. Um, is there anything I didn't ask or we didn't cover that you think is important? And I wasn't there. This is in a super small amount of time. So I think at this point, Lori knew she was in the clear. She totally loosened up and then she sat crisscross in the chair. She had been leaning forward during and looking kind of tense during the questioning. But um, like I said in the beginning, more animated when talking about the history, really tense up until the investigators like, is there anything else I didn't ask you? And then she's like, whew, you know. So Lori says, just thinking, and she's looking down at the ground and about 10 seconds of silence passes. And Lori says, just that he was so angry, super scary. He acted like a teenager when you take their phone, he freaked out. Their world disintegrates. She said she took her phone away from her 16-year-old son once and he wanted to kill himself. She said, referring to Charles's phone, is there something he doesn't want me to see? She said he was like freaking out. That's how she pronounced it. She said she thought he would hit her in the head with the bat to get to the phone. The investigator said, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you thought Charles would hurt her or Tylee, yourself or Tylee. And Lori said, absolutely, but he would never want to hurt JJ. Again, that tone was super resentful. Um, she said he did hurt Alex. He was going ballistic. It was bad. So the detective um, said she was going to speak to Tylee, and if she remembers anything to let her know. She let Lori know her partner is speaking to Alex in another interview room and asked if she needed to call anyone or wait a little bit. She said she didn't know what she would say. So the detective says we do have victim services that work within the police department. They're not cops. They're civilians. There was one on scene from the fire department, but she said theirs at the police station are more long-term type support system. She says they're just really good resources because they do a lot of stuff with our families and can help with supportive services and questions you might have. Lori says Tylee has been through so much. I can't stand for her to have to go through all this. And the investigator says it might be a good idea before I take you all back today that I get one of the victim's advocates to come in and talk to you guys. There's a bunch of stuff they can offer, but it's good to have a contact, to have a face and a name and a phone number. And Lori, of course, says that'll be good. We see Melanie when she's getting arrested for trespassing on Brandon's um, parents' property, looking for her kids and acting a fool, where she quickly asked the cops for a victim's advocate. I wonder where she learned that from. So the investigator says maybe a couple of days from now or a week from now, if there's something going on and you think you need help with something, it may not be something up, you know, her and her partner's alley, but it might be up the victim's advocate's alleys. So I'd like for you to meet one of them. And hopefully if it's something they can help you or your daughter or even JJ, they can. And Lori said, I hadn't thought of him. She hadn't thought of him. She puts her head in her hands and giggles, y'all. Lori said she was used to Charles not being there and he wouldn't understand if you told him, meaning JJ wouldn't understand. If you told him someone passed away, he wouldn't know what that means. But, you know, one thing that you find out later on in this timeline, when JJ was in his last few days at this awesome school in Arizona, they said JJ was angry. And he was saying that Charles wasn't in heaven, that he was just at work. You tell me that kid don't understand what heaven is. The investigator says it's hard at seven to understand, and Lori says that's true, and with him, he doesn't understand, which is probably better that he doesn't comprehend things. She said it's a lot to think about, and she just dismisses JJ as, you know, uh, not having a lick of intelligence, and we know that's not true. Um, it's just the way she talks about him. It just, oh, man. So when the investigator leaves, Lori reaches for a tissue. Okay, I'm going to throw this up on screen on YouTube. Okay, so you see the difference in Lori and Tylee. The pictures is when Tylee had that moment, that breakdown. And then you see Lori smiling. And then um, I put this out on social media, that far bottom right picture 
When the investigator leaves, Lori grabs a tissue and acts like she's dabbing her eyes, but Lori lets herself be known because she looks up at the camera. She knows she's on camera. So Lori waits for the most part, sitting crisscross with her arms folded at her waist. So the investigator comes in, says she'll go get victim services, who comes in eventually, and the investigator says they can talk, and Lori can decide if Tylee comes in, and Lori says, I don't want her to be left alone in there. So I'm going to throw this up on screen because I just want to keep it there on YouTube. We're going to do Tylee's police station interview really quickly. Then we're going to be done for the day. Um, 12 minutes, 43 seconds into waiting. She hits her hands together. You hear it. It's loud. She starts to cry. And you can tell this poor baby is trying so hard to just keep her composure. And she wipes her eyes with her hands in her shirts. And, and then she breathes in and out really, really deeply. And it's just pitiful. So her interview started at 1014 a.m. She had waited 32 minutes alone before the investigator comes in. She's fidgety, nervous. She's humming a song from Moana, uh, cracks her knuckles in her toes, scra uh, stretches her arms, cracks her back. You can kind of hear Lori next door talking through the wall. So the investigator comes in and says hi, and Tally says hi and smiles. The investigator says, you have to spell your name. We're all taking guesses on how to spell it. Tylee smiles and spells her name. The investigator says, I was right. So she goes through the birthday cell phone. And the investigator says, I know this is going to sound silly because it's super broad, but can you basically tell me what happened today? And Tylee nods, yes. The investigator says, you can start at whatever place. It makes sense for you to kind of start. And I may ask questions. So Tylee says she woke up probably around 7.50 because she heard yelling from right outside her door. I don't even know what I heard, but I immediately jumped up. I have a baseball bat because when I was living at my Uncle Alex's by myself, I just wanted something to feel safer, and I'm not old enough to get pepper spray or anything. So when Lori was gone, I think this is when Tyler was staying with Alex. Maybe it was before I've heard a couple of different versions, but Alex is a truck driver. You've got a kid who's 15, 16 staying by herself. So the investigator says, so right outside your bedroom door, I didn't go inside your house. So I'm at a bit of a disadvantage. Where does your bedroom door open to? How in the world? She's outside the house because we see her on body cam. How does she not go inside to orient herself to hear versions of where everybody was? It, it just, Tally says, oh, my bedroom door opens and she kind of hand gestures to where each room is in the house. And she says, there's a little hallway, but everything happened in the big room. And she said, you could tell that Tylee, the face she made was really funny. She said, right now it has mirrors up because my mom wanted a dance room. And Tylee says, kind of unconventional, but. So I immediately jump up and grab my bat and I open the door and it's my stepdad, you know, outside the doorway. And my uncle kind of in the doorway and I could hear my mom behind him. And he was just screaming at the both of them like, I don't even know what he was saying because honestly, I was just too wired, I guess. I told him to take a few steps back and he's like, don't tell me what to do. So I just stood there. Then my uncle kind of moved out of the way and my mom kind of went past him into the big room where everything happened. So I walked with them. The investigator said, so there were, were more in the hallway. And Tylee said, yeah, they were kind of at the end of the hallway and my mom walked all the way around and I kind of followed them and I stood and she hand gestures, says that Alex and Charles were essentially face to face and that her and Lori were off to the side. Now, here's the thing. Tylee said, I didn't do anything with the baseball bat. I just kind of held it out there and he was getting really close to my mom. So I just kind of stuck it out there between them and they were both yelling and he was like, if you hit me with that bat, you're going to go to jail. And I just stood there with the baseball bat. I really didn't say anything. So if you remember in Alex's interview, he says that Tylee pokes Charles in the upper chest, actually like pats himself in where he says. So the investigator asked who was yelling. And she said, it was mostly my stepdad. What, and then she says, well, he was really the only one yelling. My mom was kind of responding, but honestly, I couldn't tell you what they were saying. It's all jumbled up in my head. And so I just kind of stuck the baseball bat out there and he just grabbed it and tried to take it. So I held on to the end and fell and he just kind of took it in his hands like he was going to do something with it. And the investigator says, so when you fell, he ended up with the bat and Tylee said, yeah. So I fell to the ground and my uncle kind of like, 
I saw him take a step back and my um, uncle, I think, grabbed him, took him back so he couldn't do anything. And my mom said to go with JJ. So I ran out the door. I kind of just stood there with my little brother and just he was in the front seat of the car. So I opened the door and stood there and he was trying to get out. And I was like, no, we have to stay in. I asked him if he wanted to go in the Jeep and he said no. And then I realized my car was blocked, so I couldn't anyways. So I told him to stay here and eventually my mom came out and then we left from there. The investigator asked, do you know what happened inside the house? Did she explain it all to you? Tally says, um, I just kind of asked her because I heard a noise, which I know what it was now, but it sounded like someone took the baseball bat and hit it really hard on the floor. And I wanted to make sure my stepdad didn't do anything to my uncle. And mom was like, Al's fine. We just got to take JJ to school. Then we went to Burger King because my little brother wanted breakfast. The investigator says, so let's back up. You said you put the bat out because your stepdad was coming at your mom. Can you describe to me a little bit better what was going on there? Is there a reason you put the bat up? Tally said, yeah, he was walking towards my mom and I didn't want him to do anything. So I just stuck out the bat. My mom was right beside me, and it's not like I put the bat between them. I just stuck it out to be like, keep your distance. And when you said you didn't want him to do anything, what did you think he was going to do? Tally said, hit her. She said, for the most part, it's been pretty mundane, but there have been a few violent times with him when I was scared he was going to hit me or my mom just because everything was kind of crazy. Me and, me and him have always kind of not gotten along since I just was little. And there's been a few times we've gotten in fights and stuff like that. So I'm always scared of that. Investigator says, okay, so that happened. And he grabbed the bat from you. Tell me about that again. Tally said, I kind of stuck it out. And this is when he said, if you hit me, you're going to go to jail. And I didn't say anything because I'm like, okay. And I'm holding the bat and he took it. And I just kind of lunged forward and lost my footing. And my mom was like, just let go. And so I kind of slipped and fell on my side. At that point, my mom said, go to the car. So I just ran out the door. The investigator said, when you fell, did you see what he did with the bat? And Tylee said, no, I really wasn't looking because where I fell, the door was more in my line of vision. And the investigator said, Charles was in a different line of vision. And Tylee says, yes. The investigator says, you didn't, um, the investigator says, you see him take a step back. And from what you're saying and telling me if I'm wrong, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that you didn't necessarily see your uncle pull him back. And Tally says, yeah, it seems like he wouldn't have taken a step back on his own. So it's more of an assumption than anything. I didn't physically see him taken back. I think that's maybe a little coaching there because if you remember, Alex doesn't talk about grabbing Charles from behind until late in the interview. Lori talks about it. And then you got Tally saying, well, I just kind of assumed he grabbed him. Because it didn't make sense. He took a step back. So it's just these little things. And the investigator says, uh, does that make sense based on where your uncle was at the time? Tally says, yeah, he was behind him because he was on the side with me and my mom. And she said, that's the order. Everyone walked out. The investigator said, so when your mom told you to go, did you see what happened with your stepdad and uncle? And Tally says, no. The investigator says, so once you went outside, you never went back inside. And Tylee pauses here for a second and she looks up. Then she says, I went inside to get my mom's purse so we could have her wallet. But this was all happening in the bigger room. And I went through the garage door. And then there's a little hallway. She's motioning with her hands. And she says, and this is the room where everything is happening. And this is my mom's room. And when I went in, I just kind of tuned everything out, ran to my mom's closet and ran out so I didn't see or hear anything. I'm going to put this back on the screen. If you're on YouTube, that far right picture, I think that hallway is where the garage leads to. She would have had to have run straight past through here, which means that Alex definitely would have seen her. Um, he would have seen Lori. He says they were gone. There's a thousand mirrors in this house. Lori says that they didn't even talk because they were in shock. And but this just proves the point. A lot of this makes no sense. Alex, I didn't see him till they pull back up. Tylee had to have run from this hallway in this far right picture. You see the black spot where Charles was. 
So I'm just saying it's it's just one of those things that is a little thing. The um, the investigator asks, when did you go back in to get your mom's purse? And Tylee said, after my mom came out. The investigator said, after you heard the loud noise, and Tylee said, yeah. So you got Alex saying they were gone. Tylee goes in after she heard the loud noise, after her mom comes out, which means Lori was in there when he was shot. The investigator says, so when you heard the loud noise, was your mom inside or outside? And Tylee's like cracking her knuckles and saying, um, looks up in the distance and says she's trying to think she says i think my mom was inside and the door opened immediately after it happened she said it wasn't a long period of time because i remember not thinking about it for that long because if my mom hadn't come out i would have been thinking about it for a lot longer than i had bless it this poor kid she just i think just kind of caught like tripped her up a bit and man you just see it if you guys haven't watched this video, you know, go because you really see it. You see how conflicted she was. So the investigator says, I don't know your mom, stepdad or uncle. So can you tell me where the three of them were at emotionally and how they were behaving when this all was happening when you come out of your room? Tally said, so my stepdad was like, he was like, I don't even know how to explain it. He honestly just looked like a crazy person, screaming, his face was beat red, and he just looked really mad. I remember when he took the bat from me, the look on his face for a split second that I saw, he didn't look like himself, so much rage. I haven't seen him all the way like that before. It's the craziest I've ever seen him. My uncle was kind of calm, not super calm. Obviously, it was a stressful situation. He was standing in the doorway, kind of being protective of my mom. He wasn't yelling or saying anything. Charles was yelling at my mom and just, and mom was just kind of talking. The investigator says, you don't remember what your mom was saying or what Charles was mad about. And Tylee says, no, not really. I'm sorry. So you have Alex and Tylee both who were in there for the bulk of the argument, alleged argument, don't know what was said. You know, um, you have to wonder, is that something they just didn't think about before um, they got this story? I mean, like I said in the last episode, Tylee is a victim and she was 16, a kid, and she had to live with her mom and Alex. God knows what she knew. Um, we don't know what kind of situation they put her in uh, about this. Uh, it could not have been anything but scary for her. So the investigator says, we're talking about something that took place in two seconds. And Tylee said, yeah, honestly, it felt like two seconds and 40 minutes at the same time. I just heard yelling over everything. I do that when certain things are loud. I just tune it out. Yelling isn't fun for a kid to hear. With my biological dad, I always heard him screaming, so I just tuned it out. The investigator asked, so when you woke up and heard yelling but didn't know what was being said, did you know who was yelling? Tally said, yeah, my stepdad. Well, at first, I didn't, you know, how when you first wake up, you're disoriented. Then I remembered my stepdad was coming in to take my little brother to school. So I immediately knew it was him and then my uncle. I knew he was staying, so I knew that it was him, and then my mom, I knew that was her. The investigator says, so you went out of your room and took your bat out. Is there a reason why you took your bat with you? Tally said, honestly, I think it's first instinct. Obviously, I didn't hit him with the bat or anything like that. It was just kind of for security, I guess, to know that I had it. In hindsight, I shouldn't have brought it out because it caused more trouble. Bless it. She's trying to take responsibility for her mom and Alex's murder plan. She said, but it was first instinct and it was right by my bed. So I just jumped up and grabbed it. The investigator says, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. She did that with Lori. So was there something in particular you were concerned about to take the bat with you? Tylee said, only if he had been violent towards me or my mom. It wasn't like I'm going to take the bat and do something. I needed something in my hand to feel safer. The investigator, we're almost done, guys. The investigator says, my second question, is there anything we didn't talk about you think is important? Tylee said that was pretty much it. So the investigator tells Tylee, I talked to your mom about victim services, and she says, I want your mom to talk to them to have extra support if you need anything moving forward. I'm going to check in with you and your, with your mom real quick, and that way you can meet her before I take you back. So she leaves Tylee again for around 30 minutes. Tylee sits there, lays her head down, puts her uh, hand over her eyes with her head down. So finally the lady comes in and says she will take her home or take her to her mom. 
So after the interview, police drive him home and the crime scene was still being processed so they couldn't stay. They left. Detective Moffat noted, I drove Alex, Lori, and Tylee back to the residence on Four Peaks so they could get a vehicle and go somewhere while the scene was being processed. During the ride back to the residence, there was no further discussion about this incident. In the van ride, there was informal conversation by mainly Lori. The conversation between Lori and us was lighthearted and seemed odd in light of the events of the day. Alex, Lori, and Tyler left the residence and I remained on scene at the residence while the scene was completed. So we're going to end there. Uh, this has gone about 48 minutes. This is long stuff. Just very important. Uh, so thank you guys for being patient. It's just important to tell this whole story. And to go through the entire police interviews so that you can see, um, how, I don't know how they didn't bring them back in for other interviews days later. Let's see how it is when they are not on guard so much. Uh, phone records. I mean, there's so many things that could have been done that would have possibly stopped, you know, JJ, Tally, and Tammy from being murdered. And, uh, just is so so unfortunate the other thing that i do want to say and i think i said this i, I just don't understand that di distance of the bat from charles makes absolutely no sense also alex said that he shot straight if you're on youtube the far right pictures that is a strike straight in the ground and that is something that investigators realize the day of we'll get to that tomorrow how it doesn't end in an arrest, I have no clue. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions. Even easier than choosing to keep the Grinch away from the toy drive. He's going to deliver the toys to the kids. What about me, the Grinch? No. Yep, even easier than that. You steal the presents one time. With no fees or minimums and no overdraft fees, is it even a decision? That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. Capital One NA member FDIC. Copyright Dr. Seuss Enterprises. Copyright Turner Entertainment Company. Every day my company gets scam phishing emails trying to get money or sensitive info. I wanted to protect my employees and my clients, so I checked out CISA's Secure Our World. They've got simple ways we can protect our businesses from online threats. First, teach employees to recognize and report phishing. Next, require strong passwords plus multi-factor authentication. And finally, turn on automatic updates for your business software. To learn more, go to CISA at CISA.gov forward slash secure our world.